Welcome to the Bible class of Jews for Jesus with Bob Mendelson. Judges chapter 21. Remember what happened last week and the week before. We saw that certain Levite who sliced and diced this woman who was his concubine sent her in 12 e parcels to the tribes around the country and they responded as one man last week and came up in battle against the Benjamites and that was a pretty sad story with tens of thousands of Jewish people the the, the, the people of Israel um, killed in battle unnecessarily so verse 1 now the men of Israel had sworn in Mitzpah saying none of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin in marriage so the people came to Bethel and sat there before God until evening lifted up their voices and wept greatly. Gadol. Is this the city of Bethel? We asked that last week, and I'm not convinced it's a particular village. I'm pretty convinced this is where the house of God, that's what Bethel means. And so it should say Shiloh for some Shiloh. reason. For some reason, Samuel, who wrote this, says Bethel. Isn't that where Samuel it is. Yeah, I mean, it could be, and that's what commentators argue about. It could be the city or village, really, hamlet of Bethel. But I, I think that they came together to the house of God and prayed. And we'll also see at the end of verse 4 that they brought offerings. You wouldn't do that in some village. You would do that at the house of God. So my conviction is that this is the sacred place to which they should have gone and sought him and offered praises and prayers. But I like verse 2, that they sat before God until evening, which sounds to me like they were contemplative. They weren't in a hurry. They didn't have, you know, we got things to do, God. We, we got to hurry up. But they lifted up their voices and wept greatly. They were feeling, what were they feeling? Why were they crying? Mm, think back to chapter 20. What had just happened? A lot of death. Yeah, it's a civil war. Jews killing Jews. This is a horrible thing to reflect on. Even though it was excising some significant evil in the camp, even so, it's not a pleasant idea. It's really painful. And I think I think that's it. And also this uh, continuity of the tribe of Benjamin is going to be prevented because we've all sworn we're not going to give any of our women to the Benjamites. So they cried out in verse 3. They said, Why, O Lord, God of Israel, has this come about in Israel so that one tribe should be, and the word missing is actually, missing in Israel. They prayed. Remember, it was God who kept telling them to go up to battle. And on the third day, they had that very clever surround and ambush that caused the Benjamites to die in the tens of thousands. It's a horrible thing. And yet here they are praying. Why should it be this way? Do you ever pray these kinds of prayers where it seems as though God told you to do something and then you say, yeah, but why did you do that? Why am I in this really somber and sad situation? Yeah, the, you know, God doesn't always invite our rationale. He doesn't invite us to ask his rationale. He is happy to tell us to do stuff with or without information as far as why we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, and I like that the, the people of God in the record of scripture, and I think you should be free to do the same, say, heck, how come? Why? What's this about? Doesn't mean God's going to send you an email and communicate and get you clear. This happens so that, but like you say, that we might sometimes get the big picture. Sometimes we don't get it. Look at Psalm 103, verse 7. Yodia Livnei Yisrael alilotav. The Lord made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. What God did, he showed to the people. He made known his way, his persona, his not just what he's going to do, but why he did what he did to Moses. So sometimes we get it, and sometimes we don't. All we can see is what he's doing, but not why he's doing it. And so you read in the record of Scripture, How long, O Lord? Why do the nations rage? Lama Ragushu Goyim. Things like that. You say, yeah, I'm. that's my prayer. Uh, you read the Psalms and you say, David, you're my man. I mean, that's exactly the way I'm feeling. Asaf, what you're saying is exactly what I'm feeling. And that's okay. God is not stressed when you ask him why questions. 
he will not always answer why questions, but that you can ask is always right. <laughs> he's, the, he's not going to be upset at you and say, hey, you numbskull kid, just do what I'm telling you. Because he wants to communicate his being, his persona to us. I'm glad you asked. I may not get to it today. I may not get to it in the, in the next month. I may not ever get to it before you... Because what I'm more interested in is that you trust me mm -hmm. than that you understand all things. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Look at the order of things in Hebrews 11. By uh, Faith is the assurance of things we hope for. So first we hope for and then we gain assurance. It's the conviction of things not seen. I don't see it and then I get convicted of it. And well, look at verse 3. By faith we understand. Not by understanding we believe. We believe and therefore we understand. Understanding is, is a, a function of faith, not of mental acumen. And we will never know enough to believe enough to trust the living God. We will believe, and that will cause us to understand. What do we understand? That the worlds were prepared by the Word of God, that He spoke and it was. And so there are people at universities today who say, I don't get it. I don't believe in God because I see creation. And we say, I believe God created because I believe God. By faith, we understand, not by understanding we believe. Look at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. He who comes to God must believe that He is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This notion of faith is the basis of all life with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yeah, but I would believe, except I have all this other data. Well, submit your data before God and watch your faith rise. If you think you can ever know enough to believe enough, you got it backwards. I'm not saying be ignorant. I'm not saying dismiss information. I'm saying let information information bolster what you already have, which is faith. Does that make sense? Okay. So back to Judges in verse 3, they said, Why, O Lord, God of Israel? And I hear them almost aching, saying, You're the God of all Israel. We were the Israel that just gathered as one man in the last chapter. Why has this come about in Israel, so that one tribe should be missing today in Israel? You hear the threefold Israel. He's saying, wait a minute. I mean, modern days we'd say this. Wait a minute. They're Jewish people. We're Jewish people. How come those Jews aren't part of us. There's, there's something aching in the prayer that says, this just isn't right. But they're not saying, God, you're wrong. They're saying, why? Help us understand this. That's, how, that's holy and it's healthy. Verse 4, it came about the next day that the people arose early, built an altar there, offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Because the altar wasn't built, some say that this really is the village of Bethel and not Shiloh, because at Shiloh there was already the tabernacle. So that makes sense. And I'm not going to go to war over what place this was. Just know this, that they did holy things here. They're offering prayers. They're still before God. They're probably singing and praying. They definitely offered offerings of both burnt offerings, which are comprehensive offerings, which are completely for God, and peace offerings between them and God. So they're doing the things that Leviticus tells them to do, and they're doing it, I think, in a religious way to secure not victory, but to secure the people of God as one. Give us wisdom. Give us clarity. We love you, they're saying, without using those words. So the tribe said in verse 5, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who didn't come up in the assembly to the Lord? They'd taken a great oath concerning concerning him who didn't come up to the Lord at Mitzpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And the sons of Israel were sorry for their brother Benjamin, said, Well, one tribe is cut off from Israel today. What should we do for wives for those who are left? Even though they've already excised Benjamin from their community, even though they've gone on this military excursion, even though they've already won the battle against Benjamin, they've run the ambush, they've run him out of town, they said, We still have to, I mean, the 
sons are not guilty for their father's crime. Here are these boys. They've got to have women. We've got to keep the family going. There's something holy and sacred about that, that even though someone has erred, that their children should not be responsible for the sins of the father. You see that kind of, I want to call it Rachmanis, that mercy that is so apparent in that phrase. It's beautiful. And I think that they were right to say, okay, the tribe is cut off. However, let's not make this permanent. I see that, by the way, just hold, keep your uh, finger there and look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is uh, an uncomfortable section to read because it's so graphic and so modern. It's historic and it's so modern. It's actually reported that there is immorality among you and immorality of such a kind does not even exist among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. What is that? He's sleeping with his stepmother. That's pretty sick. He says to the Corinthians, you've become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who's done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, I've already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present in the name of our Lord Yeshua. When you're assembled and I'm with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Yeshua, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Yeshua. Your boasting isn't good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are in fact unleavened for the Messiah. Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So let's keep the feast, not with the old leaven, uh, the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. The Greek word Pornuo. I did not at all like pornographic people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous or swindlers or idolaters who are not yet believers. That's what he's saying. For then you'd have to go to Mars or New Zealand. You know, you have to go out of the world. But actually, he says in verse 11, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's immoral or covetous or an idolater or reviler or drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. What do I have to do with judging outsiders? Don't you know that those outside God will judge? Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Here he's saying that there's a fellow in the community of faith who's living pornographically, who's living immorally, sleeping with his stepmother. That guy needs to be removed from the community of faith for a while. He doesn't say that in the phrase for a while, but we know from Second Corinthians, Mm -hmm. that he's welcomed back into the community having been restored. So this isn't an excise to be comprehensively gone. Goodbye, buddy. You're never going to make it as a believer. It's a short-term judgment of discipline so that he can be, what, what does it say? For the destruction of his flesh. That is, that he'll learn better that the holy people can't be infected with that kind of stuff. So get him out, clean him up, so that you can bring him back in and have a kosher community. As you are, in fact, he says, already unleavened. So so leaven the symbol of sin, get the leavened one out from among you, bring him back in unleavened. The idea of excising or excommunicating is not a permanent institution. It's designed for cleansing both of the community and that person so that they can be merged back together well. That seems to be in the heart of the people of Israel in the prayer and the establishment of the daughters, these future daughters-in-law for the Benjamites. Verse 6 of Judges 21. And the sons of Israel were sorry for their brother Benjamin and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel today. I like that. They were Nacham. Nacham. Any idea what else that could mean? Well, Noach. Yeah, that's Noach. right. Comfort. Nachamu ami, comfort my people. Uh, there is a relationship between Noach, rest, and Nacham, comfort. 42, I think, out of the 45 times in the Older Testament, King James, it's translated as comfort, but sometimes it's 
repentance or sorrow. And when we think of it, this nacham, this uh, we're sorry for the brother Benjamin, it's not we're comforted for our brother Benjamin, we really are upset. And we don't have comfort, it's exactly the opposite feel. But in context, it's saying we want to bear the sorrow of the breakup of the family relationship. One tribe is cut off. I mean, that's clearly from Israel today. What should we do for wives, for those who are left, since we've already sworn? I love that they're taking this on board as their responsibility. Yeah, there's no guarantee. Well, that's faith. We don't have guarantee when we restore anybody to relationship. There's no such thing as a guarantee. Yeah, yep. Well, you've heard the modern axiom. um, What do they say? Uh, Burn me once, shame on you. Burn me twice, shame on me. Well, Yeshua said, how about 70 times seven? Not twice, not once. You know, Peter in Matthew 18 says, Lord, how often should my brother offend me and I forgive him? How about seven times? Pretty good, eh? And and it is pretty good because biblically up to four was plenty. And so here's Peter being generous way beyond measure. How about seven times? And Yeshua says seven. You want to hear, it's one of those mess. Come on, buddy. 70 times seven, which doesn't mean 490. Mathematically, it does mean 490. But it doesn't, it, what it means is don't count. How many times should my brother offend me and I'm gonna offend and forgive him? Seven, how about 14? How about 21? I feel like an auction's happening. 29, 30, 40, 400, 490. Any bigger, inner bigger? 490, 491, 490. No, don't count. Love believes all things, endures all things, no. hopes all things. When we repent, we can be forgiven. Yes, own that for you personally. Two days ago, sorry, three days days ago, I was very short. I was outraged as a young man, I call him the lad, across the street, pulled up and parked. I I didn't see the activity. I saw the result. He's parked on my nature strip on my yard right here. It's two thirds of his car is parked on my yard. And I was outraged. I pull in about 830. I got home late Monday night and I knocked at the door of the house across the street, said, "Um, who's, and they, they knew right away that it was I was there because of the parking. He comes running out. And I ha- I laced into the young lad and said, what were you thinking? And he started to answer and I interrupted him, which was rude. And he, he then went down and he moved the car and he came back and I said again, what were you thinking? He said, I don't want to talk to you, old man. And <laughs> all right, all right. Because I wasn't being polite and I was outraged. I wanted to vent and I wanted to lecture and who died and made me Pope, right? So, <laughs> so I felt so bad on Tuesday. I felt bad Monday. My wife had a long chat with me Monday night, uh, yeah. which, for which I'm grateful. I'm really grateful. She said, what do you think might have been a better response? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, right? And it was all good. No, she was right to help me sort things out. So Tuesday, I just all day mused in my bad feelings. And Wednesday, I woke up yesterday morning and I wrote a fairly long letter of apology and uh, went and gave it across the street and put it in the you door. You put it in the mailbox? Not in the mailbox, right in the door. And I was not on his car. Uh, <laughs> he'd have thought it was a ticket or something. No, but I, so hopefully my repentance brings forgiveness. In that circumstance, I hope that the young lad will give me forgiveness in due course. I'm not sure that I'll ever hear from him again, but we'll see. That said, if that same circumstance was not met by his apology, what's my responsibility? Forgiveness. So even though he doesn't repent, I should forgive. At the end of the day, I'm the one bearing the hostility. That's useless. He can go on scot-free and I'll, if he died and I hadn't forgiven him, I've still got this this tether of unforgiveness in my heart that's keeping me bound. I think I would behave a little more kindly. I think there would be a different tone in me and I think it would bring a different result. I think it would. We are, yeah, that, these are circumstances that are particular. I'm talking about the general understanding of human relationships. 
We are so quick to guard ourselves in the 21st century from living a holy life. We guard ourselves by psychobabble that says that it's all about me and my phone is my iPhone and the me generation and whatever I want to do. Look at the last verse of this text. Last verse of Judges 21. What does it say? That is not only a characteristic of the book of Judges, it's a characteristic of the 21st century amplified times a hundred. We build higher walls against one another so that I can do whatever the heck I want to do. It's right in my own eyes. And what I'm saying is sometimes we have to be damaged. Sometimes we have to be hurt. There are laws to which everyone is accountable. And there are judges to whom everyone is accountable in these days. And if you feel that someone is out of bounds and the 491st time you've forgiven, but it's time to take them to court, there is a time for everything, and that's okay. I'm saying most of the time our human relationships are so self-guarded that we won't allow ourselves to be hurt, and then we forget about this guy on a cross who took it all for us. Forgiveness is an action that begins deep in the heart of knowing that you're not entitled. You are not an entitled person. If anybody was entitled, it'd be Yeshua. If anybody was entitled, it's the king of the universe. And what did he do but lay down his life for others? What did he do but go to the cross? What did he do but let somebody touch the hem of his garment? And power just went out of me. And he didn't turn and say, hey woman. He said, here woman. And he gave. When people took from him, when people stole from him, when people betrayed him, what did he do but extend generosity towards anyone and everyone? There is something about the entitlement of Yeshua that we've got to learn and embrace that he who was entitled gave everything. We are so far from that. Yeah, again, we're not talking particularly about any one episode and one issue. We're talking generally, this is how we need to live. Yeah, and that's when God said, you will win because of their faith. Chapter 21 of Judges, we go back and they say, well, um, who who didn't come up to the mitzpah? And they found out that this Jabesh Gilead uh, people didn't come and that not one of them was there. So the congregation, this is the massive army now, sent 12,000 of the valiant warriors down to Jabesh Gilead and they struck the edge of the sword with the women and the little ones and that's what you should do. Utterly destroy every man and woman who has lain with a man. The tainted people. They did find 400 young virgins and they preserved them and kept them aside. I don't know how young they were. They asked probably. They conducted a census. We we really don't know. They found among, verse 12, the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, 400 young Batulot who had not known a man by lying with him. It's a funny thing. You know, there's an argument in Isaiah in the Messianic prophecy about this virgin who's going to conceive and bear a child. And it's chapter 7 of Isaiah, remember? And the argument by the rabbis is that the Hebrew word Alma always means a young woman, if they wanted to use the word for virgin that never needs any other explanation, it'd be the word betula. Have you heard that argument? Okay, Isaiah 7, 14. Here, the Hebrew word is betula, meaning Uh young woman. Why would it need who had not known a man by lying with him if it always means virgin? Obviously, it doesn't always mean virgin. So the word that's used alma in Isaiah 7 actually is the only only one that doesn't need amplification. So the elders, verse 16, of the congregation said, what shall we do for wives for those who are left? I love that. Since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin. They said, well, must be an inheritance for the survivors so the tribe will not be blotted out. Everybody's agreeing we've got to do something. And we can't give them wives of our daughters because they'd already said, cursed is the one who gives a wife. Now what do we do? This is a conundrum. And this is when Jewish lawyers got to work. Verse 19, so they said, hey, there's a feast of the Lord from year to year in Shiloh, which is on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway. So they've got the map out and they've got a situation room working and they figure out, here's what we'll do. 
will command the sons of Benjamin, verse 20, go and lie in wait in the vineyards. You're pretty good at this ambush thing. And watch and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to take part in the dances, then you come out of the vineyards, each of you catch his wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. It'll come about when their fathers or brothers come to complain to us, we'll say, well, give them to us voluntarily because we didn't take for each man a Benjamin, a wife in battle, nor did you give them to them, else you would now be guilty. So they did this very clever scheme, took wives according to their number from those who danced, whom they carried away. They went and returned to their inheritance, rebuilt the cities, and lived in them. So here the Benjaminites being able to secure, literally, the daughters of the rest of the tribes of Israel, just a few hundred, and the fathers said, yeah, that'll work. I didn't really give, but I tell you what, you've already got them, so so it's a deal. We made a deal without making a deal. And it is so clever that they could kind of negotiate. Well, I didn't exactly give them, but you know, if they're walking down on the east side on the right and they're wearing a yellow shirt and it's 11 p.m. and you just happen to be there, that'll work. Verse 23, the sons of Benjamin did so, took wives according to their number from those who danced, whom they carried away. It's not klepto there. It's gazelle. Very, very bloody, bloody. Yep. And they went, returned to their inheritance, and rebuilt the cities and lived in them. And you feel good about that, that they solved, they solved a crisis of, per, of perpetuity. They solved a crisis. There were no women who had not lain with men. They'd already killed all the women who'd lain with men, who were tainted. And they, and they started over again. This is good. Sons of Israel departed, verse 24, from there at that time. Everybody went home. Every man to his tribe and family, and each one of them went out from there to his inheritance. And you want to hear the phrase, and they lived happily ever after, except the aching noise of the book of Judges ends with this heart renting in those days. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So you feel this ache. It's used several times in the book of Judges. It's the the chorus, if you will, as Samuel wrote it. It's a painful chorus that says they lived wrong. They did wrong to each other. There were some good people in it. Gideon did all right. Samson did all right at times. Ehud, Judah, you know, this one and that one. Deborah, God bless her. She was great. Yael, good. Uh huh. There were some goodies. There were some not so goodies. Jephthah, good guy. So when you look back through the book, what lessons do we learn? We learn that God is sovereign, that God wants his people to do things his, his way. What we learn is that God is sovereign over his people and that he longs for his people to know him personally. That in the midst of a bunch of nonsense and misbehavior, he still has a way to make his people his. And when we reject him almost carte blanche, and do what's right in our own eyes. He still preserves us. Though everything says, you're not gonna make it, we make it. Here we are, thousands of years later, still reading the very book that says, yeah, don't go that way. The book that we read in 1 Corinthians 10 last week that says, this book is written for our instruction that we might live well and not unwell, that we might live behaving the right way. So we read sometimes, and Mary listened and she believed, and we say, that's what I want to be. I want to be like Mary. Stephen stands there as he's being stoned, and he looks up and he sees Yeshua standing, and he says, into your hand I commit my spirit, basically. He says these holy words that I see the Son of Man stand. And and we say, I want to be like Stephen. And we see the Apostle Paul standing in front of this group and that group. We see Yeshua. We say, I want to be like those guys. And then we see guys like Judas and Peter and Thomas. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not going to believe it unless I see it myself. And, And we see the pluses and the minuses, the good guys who do good things, the bad guys who do bad things, the good guys who do bad things. And we say, well, I, I want to learn from this. 
how to behave in this dark and darkening world that I might represent Yeshua that much better and go and apologize to my lad neighbor across the street and live right. Let's do that and not do what's right in our own eyes. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Let's learn God's ways. Thank you.